Hey, what's going on, gang? This is Nate on the Stone. Welcome back to my channel. On August 28th, 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. stood on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial and said, quote, I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, sons of former slaves and sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream that one day in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. If King gave that speech today, he'd be crucified for peddling such interracial crud. The message from society today is that white people and minority people, whether they're black, Hispanic, Asian, gay, whatever, cannot live together. And that a new segregation is actually needed to protect minority people and for the sake of diversity. This is in fact why 75 colleges now have segregated commencements for white students and black students separately, and why some, such as the University of Delaware, even have what are now being called lavender commencements for students who identify as any part of the LGBTQIA2 community. This new trend was put on the front burner again just a few weeks ago after a video went viral showing a black female student telling everyone at the University of Virginia's Multicultural Center that there were too many white people there. Public service announcement. Excuse me. If y'all didn't know, this is the MSC, and frankly, there's just too many white people in here, and this is a space for people of color. So just be really cognizant of the space that you're taking up, because it does make some of us POCs uncomfortable when we see too many white people in here. It's only been open for four days, and frankly, there's the whole university for a lot of y'all to be at, and there's very few spaces for us. So keep that in mind. Thank you. Now, to be clear, if I can use Elizabeth Warren's trademarked saying, the University of Virginia's Multicultural Center, according to the university's own website, exists to, one, build understanding through dialogue, Two, equip students to become citizen leaders. And three, enhance personal development. And FYI, you can't accomplish any of those goals unless you have a plethora of students from different backgrounds, ethnicities, and cultures intermingling, talking with each other, and learning from each other. The university even kind of acknowledged this the day after this student's video went viral, saying on Twitter, quote, in order to foster the diversity of experience and ideas that make UVA a great and good place to study and work, these centers are open to all members of the university community. Not that that deterred said student who responded on Twitter by saying, quote, so many POCs are thanking me for speaking up about something they all felt, and I'm going to uplift that. This right here is the logical end goal of multiculturalism, which academics have said is a close cousin to other modes of thought, such as the politics of difference and the politics of recognition, all of which have the same overarching goal. To reevaluate disrespected identities and to change dominant patterns of representations and communication while also demanding remedies for economic and political disadvantages that minority people supposedly suffer. Modern academia, being what it is, has also created several means to justify multiculturalism, with one of those means being liberal egalitarianism. This view says that culture is important because it helps people create a sense of self-identity, and because it gives people a context of choice, which is vital, because this provides people options of meaning, without which you really can't say that you're autonomous. And because, according to this theory, minority cultures are disadvantaged, so that they cannot create a sense of self-identity, and so that they cannot have these contexts of choices, it's necessary for society to actively protect these minority cultures. Simply being neutral or passing non-discrimination laws, like as what happened with the civil rights movement, isn't enough because, it's argued, societies and cultures cannot be neutral. They always discriminate against people and cultures that are in the minority. The liberal egalitarian justification for multiculturalism uses language as one example. Knowing the language of a nation, of a people, and of a society 
gives you economic and political advantages, advantages that are not shared by people who do not know the language of a nation, people, or society. A disadvantage that can only be rectified by the state legislating actively on a minority culture's behalf. Even something as innocuous as a calendar in this light can be discriminatory, because when calendars mark off public days off, feasts and holidays like Christmas, Easter, 4th of July, they are creating what this theory calls a normalizing effect, where people internalize that one particular language, one particular religion, one particular culture is better than anyone else. And that's just one justification for multiculturalism, gang. There are plenty others. But no matter what the justification, the central idea behind it is always the same. Minority cultures cannot simply not be discriminated against. Instead, they must actively be given special protections in order to overcome the supposed disadvantages that they have and to right past wrongs, whether those wrongs are real or not, or whether they are still ongoing or not. Now, you might be asking, where the heck did this even come from? The answer? From the 60s! Specifically, it came about because of the Civil Rights Movement and what the historian Christopher Lash called the culture of narcissism. Lash argued that the traditional American culture of individualism and self-reliance was eroded post-World War II by a new culture that rewarded and embraced self-absorption. What this led to, after the civil rights movement succeeded in 1964, was every group in American society, which had not been mainstreamed by the American culture, basically lining up and then all going, uh, what about me? And thus, multiculturalism was swept in as the great defender of equality and tolerance. Except, now we have a problem. But before we dive into exactly what that problem is, if you're enjoying the video, take a sec to subscribe to the channel and to ring that bell for notifications so that you will always know when I post new videos about the culture, politics, and religion from a unique POV. Here's the problem. If elevating one's own culture, ideas, and way of doing things is seen as oppressive and wrong, then it stands to reason that every culture must be seen and must be treated as being equally valid and equally true. Which means that there are different ideas about history, philosophy, metaphysics, ethics, transcendentals, etc, 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 must all be equally true. Again, to say that one idea is right but all the other ones are false is discriminatory, according to multiculturalism. And this leads to an even worse problem in a sense because of how multiculturalism redefines culture. Instead of seeing culture as the customs, arts, institutions, and achievements of a particular people or a specific nation, multiculturalism says that culture belongs to a specific group that is bound together by a certain accidental. So for example, in this light, black people, Latino people, Asian people, LGBTQIA2 plus people all have their own unique cultures. Even though all these people theoretically belong to the same people and country and therefore should share in the same national culture. So right off the bat, a country's culture and people are pitted against each other, meaning that order is replaced over competing ideas over fundamental issues, sowing the ground for chaos. Multiculturalism does something else too. If every minority group is oppressed by the major culture, and if all the ideas held by these different minority groups are all equally true and equally valid and equally good, then the inescapable conclusion is that everything that is outside that minority group is suspicious, wrong, if not downright evil. The tolerance that was promised by multiculturalism is immediately flipped over on its head into a new kind of intolerance just intolerance towards the majority culture and everyone who happens to be in the majority culture. And there is plenty of evidence showing that this is exactly where multiculturalism has led to. For example, back in September of 2019, Teen Vogue ran an article detailing how heteronormativity, 
the idea that there are only two sexes and that these two sexes are kind of made for each other is oppressive and wrong against LGBTQIA2 people because being heteronormative, having a heteronormative mindset will make you assume that everyone that you meet is straight, which will then force LGBTQIA2 plus people to explain to you, you bigot, why they are in fact not straight. And furthermore, assuming that everyone is straight could lead you to commit the most horrible offense against someone in the 21st century that is possible. Misgendering someone. Being white today pretty much automatically means that you are racist, at least on some level, because being white means that you have white privilege, which not only shields you from the tribulations which minority people have to face every day, we're told, and which not only presents you with opportunities which you don't even know that you have, but which also fuels your implicit and unconscious biases against people of color. And remember how I said that states and individuals have to be proactive in order for multiculturalism to succeed? Well, as oppression is defined more and more on the micro level, that proactivity follows suit. So for example, don't want to be accused of cissexism, the idea that your genitals determine your sex? Don't ask a pregnant woman if she's going to have a boy or a girl. No one knows a child's gender identity until that child actually tells you what it is. Don't want to engage in your natural racism? Then don't ask a person where they're from, which would imply that they're a foreigner and that they don't fit in with the majority culture. Don't say that the most qualified person should get the job, since that implies that people of color are given a special advantage because of their skin tone. And don't, whatever you do, for God's sake, say that you don't see color because then you completely nullify someone's experiences as an ethnic person. You guys now have probably already seen where this all naturally leads, an artificial hierarchy where minority groups and the people in those groups are placed at the top of the food chain. And this is a terrible ending place because it erases the natural hierarchy. Now the natural hierarchy is something that the American Founding Fathers talked about quite a bit. Even though they created a republican system that acknowledged all men are created equal, the American founders knew, unlike their French revolutionary counterparts, that this did not mean that every single person was exactly the same. They weren't egalitarians. The American founders instead recognized that some people are naturally stronger, smarter, faster, more talented, multi-talented, more successful, more ambitious, and in some cases just plain luckier than other people. Now I will be the first one to admit, gang, that this can be discouraging and aggravating, especially if you find yourself sort of at the bottom or just floating in the middle of the natural hierarchy, or if you're looking up at everyone who is above you. It sucks. But in that cloud is the proverbial silver lining, which is this. We can change. We can improve. We can get stronger. We can get faster. We can read, watch YouTube videos, take master classes, buy Udemy courses, and learn, grow our knowledge, grow our skills. We can pick up new hobbies and become the best that we can at them. Will we ever become the best? Uh, maybe not. But as Theodore Roosevelt, our 26th president, put it, I'm not a good shot, but I shoot often. In fact, Theodore Roosevelt is a perfect example of someone moving up in the natural hierarchy. Roosevelt was a sick, weedy, asthmatic kid, but it was through study, exercise, and basically challenging himself over and over and over again, whether that was becoming a cowboy, leading the Rough Riders, entering politics in New York City, or writing 35 books, that Roosevelt became the giant that we recognize today. And the cool thing is that improving ourselves doesn't just help us rise in the natural hierarchy, it actually helps other people rise up as well. When we want to improve, the first thing that we do is find people who are above us in the hierarchy who can teach us, right? Because they obviously are where we want to be. 
And once we've sat at their feet, once we have absorbed their teachings, we can turn right around and we can teach others who are now below us on the hierarchy and we can help them ascend to a higher level. In fact, the higher up in the hierarchy we are, the more our responsibility is to raise other people up alongside of us with great power, great responsibility and all that. And because we will never be able to know everything there is to know about everything, the natural hierarchy reaffirms in our mind the fact that we need other people. It is only in communion with other people that we can actually be complete ourselves. The natural hierarchy then is actually liberating. It frees us to improve ourselves and to rise up in the natural hierarchy. And at the same time, it frees us from having to know everything that there is to know in the world because our communion with other people and their strengths will make up for our own failings and shortcomings. Multiculturalism gets rid of all of this by saying that you're a victim simply based on your skin color, etc. It is telling you that a snowball has a better chance of thriving in hell than you do of improving your own life. And because multiculturalism divides us all up into little tribes based on our melatonin levels or our desires, it makes it virtually impossible for us to seek out teachers, regardless of where they are, from whom we can actually learn and from whom we can actually improve our lives. Your only hope is a caste of Brahmins at the pinnacle of society, and who, in their enlightened generosity, will turn around to punish and crush your opponents and your enemies, which will, they promise, improve your own life. Unless, of course, you're someone like Clarence Thomas, Phyllis Schafly, or Gavin Wilson, and go against the grain of your designated minority group, in which case you will be cast out as a traitor. Because, you see, the thing is, that cast of Brahmins which promises to help you by crushing your enemies, well, they're only going to keep helping you as long as you follow the script they give you. If you depart from that, no matter how small, you become one of their new enemies. I'll put it right out here. I'll put it out here on Front Street. Natural hierarchies are not fair because life itself isn't fair. But between a system that at least gives us the chance to improve ourselves and to... I'll put it out here on Front Street. Natural hierarchies are not fair because life isn't fair. But between a system that at least gives us the chance to improve ourselves and to help other people improve themselves in their lives, and a system that traps us and stagnates us and then calls that progress, I'll choose the natural hierarchy over multiculturalism any day of the week. But as always, what say you? What are some ways that we can actually help each other rise up through the ranks of the natural hierarchy? As always, let me know your thoughts, ideas, and opinions in the comment box below. Well, that about wraps up everything for right now, gang. Before you go, if you could give the video a like and share it with your friends on social media, I would really appreciate it. It really helps me out. As always, thank you for giving me a little bit of your time, and thank you to everyone who has already subscribed to my channel. I appreciate you all. And I will see you all again here next week, gang, on Top of the Stone. And until then, dare to read, Think, speak, write, and don't be afraid to improve yourself. Ciao.